All right, let's start last couple of talks for the day. Um, we have a talk from Dimitri, senior engineer at Twitter. He's going to talk about over subscription and how they, how they did it uh, in the production quality way at Twitter. So let's start. Thank you. Uh, so I work at Twitter Compute Platform team, who is basically responsible for running Aurora and Mesos on Twitter clusters. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our solution to idle resources of our subscription, uh, in which we uh, which we use to try to improve our cluster utilization. Uh, this is still work in progress. It, it's not deployed in production, but we thought that this would be interesting to the community that we share our challenges and uh, the solutions. Um, so uh, a little bit of background on Twitter clusters. Uh, we have a cluster of uh, more than 30,000 nodes. That's a really huge cluster. And it basically runs two types of jobs. That's production and non-production jobs. Uh, most of jobs are, of course, production and they have about 80% of allocated CPUs, uh, while non-production jobs at the moment are about 10%. And cluster and P95 of CPU utilization is also different for those, for those jobs. Uh, production jobs are more effective, like uh, utilizing more than 30%, and non-production just 20. Uh, non-production jobs and production jobs have different SLAs, uh, for we, we are more flexible about non-production jobs, like we can preempt them and do some other things, while production jobs are more critical, so we treat them sort of, uh, in the proper way. Uh, so we are focusing here on non-production jobs. We won't oversubscribe uh, production jobs. Uh, so although it's just 10% of uh, CPUs allocated, uh, given the cluster size, even if we manage to get a few percents from that number, it's really lots of hosts. Uh, our most limited resource is CPUs. Uh, we're not so much bound by network or disk space or memory. Uh, and uh, the problem is that both non-production and production resource allocation is growing. So in order to keep up with this growth, we, growth, growth, we either have to add new machines to the cluster or try to find some other solutions like oversubscription. Uh, we also have an observation that many non-production jobs are actually idle, like CPU utilization is really, really low somewhere near zero. Uh, so what we did, we collected some statistics about the jobs, non-production jobs, uh, and found that many of the jobs are not using CPU, and there are some jobs which have occasional bursts in CPU utilization. But basically, almost any of those non-production jobs are idle. Uh, this kind of jobs is development, testing, or some batch processing which is not so much critical. Um, we also found some uh, utilization metrics for all the jobs. Uh, I didn't, we didn't include uh, short-lived jobs because, well, we, we cannot win much from them. Uh, we're just focusing on long-living non-production jobs. And that's about 80% of CPUs allocated for non-production jobs. Uh, here's an example of idle tasks. Uh, this chart show this graph shows CPU utilization of some service, uh, which has four CPUs allocated, but in reality CPU utilization is like less than 10% of that, and you can see some occasional bursts, but even with this burst, uh, it doesn't achieve the really allocated number of CPUs. Here's another uh, statistics. This shows cumulative distribution of all jobs. 
and c CPU utilization. So basically this means that 60% uh, of all jobs uh, with use only 25% of CPU when we use different metrics like uh, P, P95 here. So it means that 95% uh, of time job is basically using C CPU less than 25%. Uh, so we can, we can see a small spike near 100%. Uh, this just means that there are really, really very few jobs which ever reach uh, the allocation of CPUs. So if we zoom into the left side of the chart, we could find some interesting insights. So uh, P95 uh, CPU utilization of 10% is actually about reached, is actually reached by less than uh, by 50% of jobs. So basically, if we use such metrics and detect idle jobs based on these metrics, we can save, we can win 50%, uh, we can win a large amount of machines that can be used to run another non-production jobs by using oversubscription. So what we try to do is to detect underutilized CPU resources based on the metrics that we collect. Uh, then we offer these resources for oversubscription to non-production jobs. Uh, we also separate how we run production and non-production jobs. So the production jobs will use non-revocable resources, while non-production jobs are going to use just revocable resources. And we need some kind of intermediate stage when we are moving from current state when non-production jobs are using non-revocable resources. So potentially we could have non-production jobs which are using both revocable and non-revocable resources. Um, we also have some limitations and constraints. Uh, so production, non-production jobs must not affect, affect production jobs because, well, production jobs are mission critical. Uh, we cannot preempt production jobs. Uh, however, we can preempt non-production jobs. Like, what it means that we can kill a job, move it to some other node, and relaunch it there. Um, we also expect some impact on performance of non-production jobs. Uh, because we need some time to detect that there is a contention between non-production jobs, and this could take some time to collect the metrics, see that there is a contention. Uh, and during this time, we can have an impact on non-production jobs. But non-production job should, must not impact production job. So Mesos have, uh, for quite a while, Mesos have a solution to oversubscribe resources, which is basically uh, represented here. This is taken from Mesos documentation. Uh, so the two major components here are resource estimator and QoS controller. Uh, resource estimator is responsible for estimating amount of available resources for our subscription. And QoS controller is basically monitoring the state of the jobs, of the processes, and decides that it needs to take some action to ensure the quality of service. For example, uh, currently, there is just one action that supports it, is killing a job. Uh, both of them can consult resource monitor to obtain statistics from the, from the container, like CPU usage, memory usage, and all that stuff. Uh, when resource estimator obtains some value of available resources, it send is, sends it to agent, then it goes to master, and master can offer these resources to framework as revocable resources. Uh, this, this is the interface of resource estimator as it defined in Mesos. Uh, so basically, there is an initialized function which uh, accepts a uh, function with, which can be used to obtain resource usage. 
and also there is our subscribable function, which returns available resources. QS controller is very similar, same initialized function, and uh, corrections function, which should return the list of corrections. Basically, that's action to take on which container. Uh, also, frameworks must opt in to receive revocable resources with declaring capability revocable resources. Uh, by default, the framework will not receive it. Uh, there are also some parameters on agent uh, which should be used to specify resource estimate, request controller, and two parameters to define intervals which Mesos uses to query resource estimator and QS controller, uh, which are by default it's 15 seconds. So we came up with the idea of resource, idle resources over subscription, uh, which is in Mesos model can be presented like this. So for resource estimation, we detect uh, unutilized CPUs for non, by non-production jobs. Uh, that's basically allocation slack, like resources which are not allocated to any type of, of job. Uh, and we add underutilized allocated resources used by non-production jobs to that. Uh, QS control is responsible for killing non-production jobs if there are not, available, not enough available resources. This can be due to different cases. For example, we detected that non-production job is idle, and sometime after that, it became active, like it started using CPU uh, proactively. So there could be a case then that there are not enough resources now, so we should kill some of the jobs to make sure that there is no contention. And also, since we have uh, important job to keep uh, production jobs safe from contention, we must use isolation and isolate all non-production jobs in a separate group. So the basic rule for detecting idleness uh, is like this. So container is idle if P percent of samples over some window with duration uh, shows uh, CPU usage less than threshold. In other words, if we see that during a window of, for example, one day, some, of, uh, some container shows that it's only using uh, P95 metric of CPU usage less than 10%, then the job is idle. It can have some bursts, but basically P95 covers this. Uh, based on our data, we made some estimations. Uh, so using different metrics, we found that uh, we have more than 50% of tasks idle. Uh, and using different methodologies to estimate uh, idle CPUs, we came up with this 30 to 50% of uh, idle CPUs. Uh, so the lower bound is based on summing uh, integer, rounded to integer number of CPUs, because basically if we can have 0 0.8 CPUs available, um, it's almost likely that no job will be able to use it, because people tend to use integer numbers like one or two CPUs. So that's the lower bound. And the upper bound is just sum of all CPUs available. Uh, so let's see how we detect available resources. Uh, so first of all, we always ignore resources allocated to production jobs. They are not available for our subscription. Uh, if there are no non-production jobs running, then all available oversubscribable resources are equal to allocation slack, means not allocated resources. Then if we launch non-production job, location slack is reduced, and we make this available as oversubscribable resources. Uh, if we detect that the job is idle, uh, then 
we can offer unutilized resources as oversubscribable, so we just increase that amount of resources. Uh, let's see how chaos corrections work in this case. So suppose we have an idle non-production job running using revocable resources, and uh, we launch another production job. So that means that our allocation slack is reduced, and we have to reduce the amount of oversubscribable resources. Uh, so uh, in this case, we see that non-production job is no longer having enough resources. Uh, basically, it's starving. So we need to kill it and to relaunch somewhere else. Another use case is when a non-production job becomes non-idle. So we have two jobs. One is idle, one is not. And then that first job becomes non-idle. Again, we, know, we now don't have enough resources to have them both on the same host. So we should kill one of them. Uh, our case correction strategy is to kill non-idle jobs and preserve idleness. This might seem counterintuitive, because why would we kill non-idle jobs? It's doing something, right? Uh, the reason is that if we kill idle job, it will be rescheduled somewhere else as non-idle. So in the end, we will have two non-idle jobs running. But if we kill a non-idle job, then we will have one idle job, and we will relaunch non-idle job somewhere else. Um, this also requires uh, some uh, some taking care of recovery to preserve idleness because uh, we wanted to start with uh, idleness window of one day or maybe one week and that's a long time like we need to update agents on the hosts many different things can happen so uh, if we don't preserve this uh, I, uh, information then each restart of the agents will cause restart of the jobs possibly so we checkpoint, instead of check, checkpointing all the samples obtained from the job during one, win, during one day, for example, or one week, this could be a huge amount of data. So instead, we checkpoint statistics and a few timestamps. Uh, when agent restarts, we recover the, the samples. Uh, so this can be illustrated on this graph. Suppose that's CPU utilization over time during some period of time. Uh, how statistics is obtained? Basically, we sort our samples by value uh, and then uh, take the metrics like P50, P90, P95 maximum. Uh, when we try to reconstruct, we do this conservatively. So we don't have any data about samples between metrics. So we just assume that the the CPU usage was at possible maximum. Uh, then we just convert from statistics space to time space to receive uh, samples. And there's one more thing that during agent downtime, we need to shift the samples by this time. Uh, here we just assume that while agent was down, uh, the CPU usage remained constant, and it was our maximum obtained sample. Uh, so this overestimates, tends to overestimate CPU utilization, but it's conservative. It means that non-idle job will remain non-idle. Due to the way it's reconstructed, idle jobs may become non-idle, but that's okay. We will just if there are enough resources, they will keep running. If not, then we will kill the job and re relaunch it somewhere else in the cluster. And also, after this reconstruction, because we rearrange samples from lowest value to the maximum value, uh, it means that the job can remain on idle for more time after such reconstruction. That's also fine. Uh, so we implemented this using Mesos model and found some difficulties, that it didn't work well. 
So first of all, there was an issue with decreasing our subscribable resources. Uh, this happens between, because there is a delay between killing non-production job and update of the resources. Uh, like, there was an interval, there is an interval in Mesos which is used for QS corrections and for oversubscription. So if, if scheduler can, manages to get into this between those two actions, uh, it can launch a task using old amount of resources. So more details on this. So resource estimator, when resource estimator is called, it's, it must return additional amount of oversubscribable resources, uh, not the total amount. That's one of the issues. So here in this case, we have production and production job, and we use a location slab to return oversubscribable resources. When we launch another job, so basically here we, amount of oversubscribable resources is negative because those containers CPU usage over, uh, CPU allocation overlaps, but we cannot return negative value from oversubscribable function. So the best we can do is return zero, meaning we don't have uh, oversubscribable resources anymore. Then ish, uh, make a QS correction to kill a container but now there is a delay or between killing a container and a Mesos calling oversubscribable method. Uh, during this time, master is not aware of change of resources, and it can offer it to framework, framework can accept resources, and launch another job. And basically, we end in the same situation, and we, we make a loop when we should kill job, hope that uh, run est resource estimator runs before the framework, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the workaround that we came with came from a resource estimator and QS control interfaces. Uh, so they, they return futures of uh, resources and QS corrections. Uh, we don't have to act immediately like if we are requested to return our subscribable resources, we don't have to go estimate it right now and return. So what instead we, what we do instead is we make a promise to return resources and basically do nothing. Uh, when we see that there is a change that we must react to, we then complete these futures. So our reaction is immediately as soon as we detect the change. We don't have to wait another cycle of uh, requests from Mesos. Uh, so this way we control resource estimating and course correction, re resources estimation and corrections by completing future when, by, at the right time when we detect the change. Uh, to detect the changes, we need to hook executor and task lifecycle events to, re to react to tho those changes. And we must also adjust Mesos, how Mesos works by setting intervals to zeros. This basically means that when we complete the future, Mesos immediately requests the new value, which we can hold on, hold, hold on till we detect another change. Uh, we also found that there was duplicate work between resource estimator and QS controller and really high coupling between them. So instead of having two different modules which run independently, we came up with this structure where oversubscriber is basically a combination of resource estimator and QS controller uh, and combines both of them. Uh, there is oversubscriber factory, factory to ensure that we create only one oversubscriber and that it's, this one instance is used by both resource estimator and QS controller modules. Uh, from this point, it's pretty much standard for Mesos when we have an interface and the process, lib process process, which is responsible for handling the requests. So here, idle of oversubscriber just dispatches requests to idle of subscriber process. And we also added uh, hooks implementation to catch task transitions. 
Uh, this makes configuration a little bit weird because we have to collect all parameters in a hook module just because it's created first. And then just have a names for QS control and resources estimator without any parameters, but actually they parami their parameters are in hook parameters. Uh, we also implemented isolation. Uh, this picture shows uh, current implementation of isolation in Mesos. Uh, it doesn't differentiate between jobs running on production, on revocable and non-revocable resources. So in this case, when we run too many, too many tasks run using uh, revocable resources, there is a potential for contention between production and non-production tasks. Uh, we wanted to avoid this, so we introduced a revocable C group, uh, which just groups all non-production containers underneath. So even if all of those non-production containers become non-idle, uh, due to C group limitations, it won't be able to, to affect uh, production containers. Uh, we limit revocable C group by location slack. So this ensures that uh, production containers have their share of CPU time. This has some issues because if the, we have too many, we have too many non-production containers running, uh, there could be a contention, but we might not be able to detect it. Uh, just because there are not enough resources for all of them to become non-idle. Uh, this can be solved by using some techniques to detect contention basing, based on like, uh, how much CPU is throttled and so on, or just ensure that we don't launch too much containers, non-production containers. Uh, there's also a limitation that enabling, enabling revocable isolation will take effect only on, on new tasks. Uh, but, so we would have to restart non-production uh, non tasks to make sure that they are isolate, isolated. Uh, that's fine because currently our tasks that are running on, our non-production jobs that are running on non-revocable resources they just cannot be oversubscribed. So another issue is disabling or downgrading, where we basically have to restart all tasks to make sure that uh, they cannot affect each other. Uh, we also made scale tests of the implementation and found some issues. Uh, uh, the one, of, one of them was increased frequency of, day, of agent resources updates. Like resource estimator monitors active tasks, idle tasks, and re-estimates amount of available resources. This causes uh, agent update, which is reported to master. Master then rescinds offer and sends another offer to the framework. And uh, it happened that Aurora which we use as a scheduler, uh, received too many rescinded offers and was using old offers to launch another task. So we saw many uh, issues like schedulers trying to launch uh, a, a task on old offer. Uh, so what we did is we just added tolerance if uh, change is minor, in, uh, changing available resources is minor, then we just ignore it and do not report it to, must, to the agent and the master. This significantly reduced the traffic and amount of lost tasks. Uh, so we also changed Aurora to make sure that rescinded offers are handled as soon as possible. Like uh, before that, uh, there was a one single queue for uh, processing offers and rescinding offers. Now it's out of order. If there is a rescind, then it's processed with highest priority. 
Uh, another issue is that scheduler is unaware of revocable and non-revocable resources relation. It basically means that if we launch mm, some task, like for example, production task, uh, we know that this would reduce allocation slack, and therefore it will reduce the amount of our subscribable resources available. Uh, scheduler doesn't know this, and potentially it could launch production task and non-production tasks on, on an offer, and just non-production task will be killed because allocation slack was reduced. Uh, so the current state that we made tests on, product, on our scale test cluster, which somewhat simulates our production cluster. Uh, it's not in production yet, yet we still have to fix few issues, for example, that uh, scheduler and awareness of uh, revocable and non-revocable resources relation. And our deployment plan is to fix the issues and then migrate non-production zo jobs to revocable resources. Uh, it's pretty easy to do with Aurora because we just have to do is to change tier configuration and just configure it to use revocable resources. So new tasks will autom automatically launch on non-revocable revocable resources. Uh, the tasks that are running, we basically have to restart them. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Um, production versus non-production, that's a pretty broad brush to categorize, uh, which may be applicable, which is fine, but I'm curious, have you felt the need to um, have even more finer granularities, or do you think that adds complexity and that's the reason you're not looking at a finer granularity? Well, I don't think that we need finer granularity. Basically, production jobs, uh, mission critical jobs, which have quotas and all that stuff. Uh, Non-production jobs, uh, it's usually development or testing jobs or some uh, really, uh, some, some jobs that do not require that high level of SLA which, are required, which is required for production jobs. So maybe when we start oversubscribing, we will find something different, something else. But so far, thanks. Any other questions? So, can I repeat the question? wondering if there was, uh, if you ever observed something that made all the idle jobs spike at the same time and then maybe even fail because they weren't able to get the resources they needed in a short period of time, just because there was some external thing that makes them all spike at the same time? Well, this shouldn't be an issue because of this isolation. So we grouped all revocable, all jobs running on revocable resources in the same C group. So they have limited amount of time and they cannot impact the production jobs, but if they all spike at the same time, well, th there will be contention. We're fine with, with this contention for some period of time. Uh, so it's acceptable to have this contention, but when we detect this, we will reschedule one of the, or some of the non-production jobs on the other host when we'll have probably better situation. How is your experience with the QS controller? Like, uh, do you see the kill rate is too high? Or do you see, like, the kill happening when the system is actually not under kind of heavy load? Like, have you looked into that aspect? Uh, sorry, could you repeat, please? Uh, like the QS controller, like the killing of the job. Like, how is your experience? Like, uh, do you see the kill rate is too high? 
Like, is it killing too many uh, kind of containers? Uh, well, based on the experiments, uh, I don't think that the rate would be too high. Uh -huh. Because, well, the statistics shows that really many jobs are idle. And this keeps for a very long window. So the kill only can happen if we launch a production job. That's the issue with, with, that we have with the scheduler, which is that it's not aware of relation between revocable and non-revocable resources. So this can be fixed on scheduler level, that it would prefer to launch production jobs and non-production jobs on different hosts. Like, uh, like trying, basically it's trying to to launch jobs from different directions, if you see what I mean. Uh, so another potential is to kill the job if uh, non if idle job job becomes non idle, but that doesn't happen frequently. So. I, I don't think that, given the current situation, we would have too much preempted jobs. I mean, how do you detect, like, it's pick up side as non-idle, like, uh, how do you detect, what is the, your detection mechanism? Is it like, per container you so, have Sorry, to, can you I'm this? sorry. Uh, so for like, how do you detect the system is like, the container is idle versus non-idle? So do you have per container, kind of, you're looking to the SLA for that per container? or is it based on the complete system level uh, statistics? So, idleness is basically, is this rule. So we collect metrics for each container. Uh, Mesos API allows only collection of such metrics on container level, not on each individual process. So we collect this on container level, and the parameters P, D, and threshold are the same for all, for all non-production jobs. Any other questions? So you applied this only for CPUs as a resource, or have you applied it to other resources as well? And would the strategy, if you've not applied it, would it work as well, or would you need to tweak it for uh, oversubscription of other resources? Uh, so currently, we only apply this to CPUs. Uh, potentially, there is an issue with network bandwidth. Like, if we start oversubscribing CPUs, then we would also oversubscribe the network. Uh, but since we are not currently network bound for most of the jobs, we believe that this wouldn't be a, the, the, this wouldn't affect jobs in any way. For the memory, there is no subscription, obviously, and if uh, there are not if memory if there is memory so shortage, then we, we just wouldn't launch launch no production job on this host. And then maybe I missed it. Um, given this new uh, method that you use now, what kind of uh, CPU cluster utilization improvements did you achieve? Uh, we don't have this in production yet, but okay. our estimate is that we would be able uh, to, to reclaim at least 50% of CPUs used. Yeah. Like, uh, not 50, but 30 to 40% CPUs used. Okay, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? So going back to the memory of a subscription, like uh, the OOM controller, right? The Linux OOM controller provides mechanisms to kill kind of particular task. Like, have you looked into, uh, have you started looking into the memory of a subscription? Or? Uh, or that you don't have in the plan, the memory or subscription? So, memory of subscription, uh -huh. we do not consider this. 
you're not planning, you don't have in the future plan or something? No, because we're not memory bound right now. Like our main issue is that CPU allocation is quite high and there are still idle resources that, so the, we can postpone hardware, uh, uh, buying more hardware to run the cluster. But for memory, there is just no need for now. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Thanks, Dimitri. Thank you.